The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Verse 21, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, Notice at the top of your paper, second paragraph down, there is no verb in that sentence. Well, it's not actually a sentence, but in that verse, there is no sentence. I mean, there is no verb. The word, notice the word sense, we have is not in the original text. But... The reason it's there, because verses 19 through 25 is one sentence in the Greek. And what this goes back to, and since we have, the word and is there, but the word since we have, it goes back to verse uh, 19. That sense right there is carried over. And the word therefore tells us that verse 19, which is a new sentence, goes back to 15 through 18. Okay? So it's kind of, a, you do that when you're translating in a foreign language and you want it to move smoothly through there when, in reading. You can do those kind of things. But when you, when you kind of become a little more technical, you can't have a verb in there like that. Because this is one Greek sentence. I, mean, I can't say that that's one Greek sentence and then have a complete sentence in verse, a verse there. So yet, and of course, it's not in the original text. It's not there. So, but the point that I'm after is what he told us because now we're into uh, how the new covenant doctrines are superior to old covenant doctrines. And here's one of them. The new covenant priesthood is superior to the old covenant priesthood. And it's based on the fact that Jesus Christ is a great priest over the house of God. And he's referring to the high priest. He is the great high priest over the house of God. And that's what we're going to focus on tonight. Uh, uh, we're going to focus on the new covenant, uh, the great high priest. And so it's helpful. Uh, let me have a word of prayer and then we'll get into how this whole thing is set up to take us into 19 through 25. Uh, remember that the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual living uh, by p spiritual people for spiritual living. Can't study it nor apply it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sin. It could be overt sin, mental attitude, sin of the tongue, whatever. Uh, what do I do to get out of carnality and back into spirituality fellowship with God? Well, you confess your sin. And you can do that because you are a priest. And you can go directly to the great priest. You can confess your sins. And it can be done. What does that do? It restores you. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. That's the procedure. So let's, let's, Kenny, you want to come on in or come on in? All right, so then let's go ahead and have our prayer. And we'll get into the subject matter of the superior doctrine, the doctrine of the superiority of the new covenant priesthood over the old covenant priesthood. So our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way by the automobile and by the internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the word of God within our souls because it is the truth that sets us free. Jesus said it in John 8, 32. We're so thankful for that principle. And what does it set us free from? It is the cosmic system of lies. We live today in a culture of relativism, and the Bible is the, brings us to absolutes. And that's a wonderful thing. And 
absolutes come to our life by truth. Truth that stands up against all the lies the devil can throw at it, it still remains truthful. And we're thankful for that, Father, because it stands behind, that your character stands behind the reality of truth. And we thank you for that. I encourage our hearts tonight, Father, through the study that we are new covenant priests. And I pray that we would have that established tonight by the word of God as a truth in our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I did a study when we first began, in fact, in fact, I believe in talking with John tonight or this afternoon that the first lesson I think I did with you was in January 1, uh, it was in uh, January the 23rd on a Tuesday night, I did a lesson called the Superior, the Superior Priesthood. And it would serve you well if you're interested in this subject matter to someday go back and pull that doctrine up and attach it to this one. We began with this subject and now we're closing. This ain't my last study in this, but we're, we're in the 10th chapter now. Uh, so that's an important subject. Notice uh, in verse 21, I wrote it on your page, no verb. We have the word and chi. Uh, the word sense we have goes back to verse 19, sense, and then that, because it's therefore, goes back to 15 through 18. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. And in verse 19, the emphasis, which we did a study on, is the word confidence, parousia. You remember that? We just did it. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place, i.e. heaven, how do we know that? 924 of Hebrews, by the blood of Christ, and then verse 20, through his body, the work of Christ on the cross in regard to sin. And so he says, therefore, uh, uh, we, uh, and a great high priest, there's megas, that's the word great, and priest, of course, we have that there. So just showing it, it's, they're, they're in the aorist tense. They're, uh, excuse me, they're in the accusative tense. Uh, over, epi plus the accusative, over the house of God. In other words, a great high priest is superior and as supreme uh, over the house of God. Uh, notice there's just for just to clear up something. Notice there's a definite article with the word house. That's ton, T-O-N. That's a definite article with the word house. And then we have to, T-O-U. That's a definite article with the word God. Notice when they wrote it out in the English, they didn't do that, and you don't have to. You could, if you put a definite article on the first one, and you're in a, in the same menu, then the one covers both. But in the Greek, that's not true. In the Greek, when they put a definite article with both of them, that's not required because the house of God is sufficient in the English language. But it actually would say the house of the God. And, it's to sh and I'll tell you why that is. It is to show you that the house is superior to any other house that the gods would dwell in. And the God is superior to all the other gods. So you have a definite article to the house. This is a superior house. This is a superior house to a superior God. And uh, notice they're both singular. Notice that? I, I only wrote it. I wrote, wrote it. Uh, the, of course, the, the God is, is genitive, but notice singular masculine. As I explained in my introduction, when you have in verse 21, since we have, which should all be in italics because it's not, none of it's there, but the word sense goes back in this sentence, right? We're in one sentence. It goes back to the sentence that was started in verse 19. That was the opening of it. We have it there. But actually, you know, that actually in the, it doesn't really open with and sense in verse 19. It actually opens up and therefore sense. The word therefore takes us back, you know, therefore is why for. And so it takes you back to a previous subject, which is 15 through 18. So here, here's what you have. In verse 21, you have something attached to verse 19. Verse 19 is attached to 15 through 18. Right. So we call that being able to look at 
take a text and look at it in context is the way we talk about that in theology. Here's a text, 21, always keep it in context. And so I just did that. Now, let me show you what the writer's doing to get us where we are. Look at chapter 10, verses 15 uh, through uh, 18. And notice what's significant about that. He says, and the Holy Spirit also bearing witness to us. You see that in verse 15? Now look at, 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 at probably in italics of some sort. Just before you start verse 17, it says, he then says. Okay? So he, the he there is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is prophesying. Now here's what's interesting. He's quoting two verses out of the new covenant of Jeremiah 31. 31 through 34. That is the new covenant from Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31 through 34. But in this passage, the writer picks out only two verses out of the new covenant of Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. He picks out 15 and 16. Notice I put it on your paper. In uh, verse... Uh, in verses 15 and 16, he's talking about Jeremiah 31, 33. And then in Jeremiah, uh, and then in Hebrews 10, 17 and 18, he, he's in reference to Jeremiah 31, 34. So let's take a look at that in our Bible in Hebrews 10, 15. And the Holy Spirit also bearing witness or giving testimony, prophetic testimony of something that's going to occur at a specific event in future time. We know that to be the incarnation or the coming of Christ when he goes to the cross, dies, buried, and raised from the dead. That's the consummation of the ages mentioned in Hebrews 9. I think it's 926, something like that. 926. So he says, for the Holy Spirit also bearing witness to us, for after saying... And then here we have 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them. And after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart and upon their mind. I will write them. Then that, that's quoting. The, and that's the coming of Christ. And, and how important is the Holy Spirit to the fulfillment of this? He's everything, isn't he? The, because Christ leaves, the Holy Spirit comes. And so he's actually given testimony of the coming of Christ that's going to involve a testimony concerning him once Christ leaves. Gee, listen, how, I can't tell you how important this is because the Holy Spirit is the, is the whole shooting match in the church age, right? In the church age. Okay. So that's what he's, he's making reference to. And then in verse 17 and 18, he, he, he's, he's now into verse 34. He says, and their sins, right, that is theirs is those who have been brought into the covenant through Christ, who uh, the word now is working through their hearts and minds, and their sins, watch this now, and their sins, and this is talking to you and I, and their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. That's a wonderful thing. They didn't have that in the Old Testament. This doctrine opens up a whole new door, a window for you. Do you see that? And I will remember that when the new covenant is established, I will remember when Christ pays the price for our sins, sins are, listen, sins are no longer remembered because they've been paid, right? They're done. Judicially, they're done. Now, look at verse 18. Now, where there is forgiveness of these things, what would be the things? Sins and lawless deeds, iniquity. Listen, and that's why, listen, listen. Sins and lawless deeds, listen to me now. This is why 1 John 1, 9 is important. Listen to what it says. If we confess our sins, and this is new covenant talk. If we confess our sins, as personal sins, what? God is just and faithful to forgive us our sins and what? 
from what? That fulfills that. You understand that? Fulfills that. Not only sins, right, but unrighteousness, I remember no more. Sins and, and lawless deeds. You understand that? Uh, I hope so, because the first time when I, it's a powerful idea. <laughs> it's a powerful idea. And what's God say about the sins you confess? Remember them no more. You know why? Because all of them have been paid for by his son on the cross. That's a powerful idea. Now, where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. That's a, and so this is where he is. This is where he is when he comes to 19, 20, and 21. When he comes into 19, we got one, one long sentence to 25. This is, okay, and what, what has done all that? Well, he tells you in verse 19 and 20 of chapter 10, he says, it is the blood of Christ and the body of Christ. Now, the blood of Christ is important. It, it's described in, by Peter in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. It, is the, it calls it the precious blood of Jesus. Rick, how many songs do you think we would find in the hymnal about the precious blood of Jesus? It'd be a ton, wouldn't it? And rightly so. And then in the same book, 1 Peter, you go to the second chapter, verse 24, and he says, and he, he put all the sins on the perfect body of Christ who bore them on the cross for our sake, on his body. And so it required two things for redemption to be completed as far as the offering, as far as the sacrificial offering, the blood has to be right and the body has to be right in the eyes of God, right? Yep. And let me tell you, nobody, not anybody could hang on that cross and do that. It had to be 2 Corinthians 5.21, he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might be made the righteousness of God on his behalf. And how, how important is that? Whew. And so in verse 21, having covered that information to us, he says, now we have a great high priest. And we have a great high priest. We have a great high priest. We have a great high priest over the what? House of God. And the house is superior. What is the house today? It's the church, the body of Christ. And, and it is superior to any other place of worship. It's superior to any other place of worship. And God is superior to all other gods of the world, right? Because they're all figments of imagination anyhow. That's a pretty powerful idea he just laid out. Lay that out uh, in a pretty powerful way, in my opinion. So we have, a great house, we have a great high priest over the house of God. This is because Christ was raised from the dead, has sent it back to the Father, and sets in session at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. That's why, that's why he's the great high priest. He, he never was a, a priest at all on earth. He's the high priest in heaven. Why? Because his work was finished. He went back, and God honored him by setting him at the right hand of the throne and, and, uh, and gave upon him of credentials that are superior with authority in the church age until the second coming and beyond it. It will be at the end of the whole shoot match that Jesus surrenders it all back to the Father. You know all that, don't you? You do if you go to this church. Uh, eight, uh, chapter 8, verse 1 is kind of interesting. Listen, I put it on your paper. Now the main point, what does Horton say? Keep the main point, the main right. Point. Keep, the main, keep the main point, the main point. Now, the main point in what has been said is this. We have a great, we have a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. There you have it. Okay. Nobody remembers it, but, but you have it in your notes. And that's what's important because it becomes a great source of references. Point number one, I got four points. Point number one, the biblical priesthood order, the biblical priesthood order 
was changed with the crucifixion, burial, resurrection, ascension, and session of Jesus Christ. That's a lot of stuff right there. That's a lot of stuff. That's a lot of stuff. But I didn't know any other way to walk my way through it. But when Jesus Christ dies on the cross, he must die on a cross, be buried, and raised from the dead to get this thing moving. Then he's in a post-resurrection appearances with his disciples, getting them ready for a new order for 40 days. Then he ascends back to the Father. Ten days later, we have Pentecost, and we're in the game. Kickoff. Kickoff was when he went back and was seated, and we're in the game. Now he is the great priest over the house of God, and he will. And listen, he'll always be, no matter how you vote it. <laughs> You put all your opinions that you want, you're still going to get this answer because this is truth. Now, when the high priest, and this is uh, Hebrews, I have Hebrews 7, 12. Let me, 12. Okay, this is right. Hebrews 7, 12 says, for when the priesthood is changed of necessity, there takes place a change of law also. When the order changed, there's a whole new program. Now, the order changed for sure. When Christ dies on the cross, the veil is rent from top to bottom. A new order, a new order has been sent in. <laughs> right? I mean, it's the new order is on its way. And when you look at the seventh chapter, uh, it goes on uh, through 13 through 19. It'd be well you're worth your read. And 17 through 21, the fifth chapter, verse 5. And there are other passages. Here's the point that the writer makes in all these passages I gave you. The priesthood of Jesus Christ is after the order of Melchizedek and not after Le Levi. It's not after Levi and Aaron. It's not after the tribe of Levi and the house of Aaron. The high priesthood, you know, the priesthood came from Levi and the high priest came from Aaron's house. So the tribe of Levi and the house of See, that's why the house of God is so important to the new covenant when he makes that statement. And what they're quoting when they tell you these things, that after the order of Melchizedek, they're quoting, they're quoting, um, they're quoting Abraham, uh, and they're quoting David, and they're quoting, they're quoting the new covenant. There are three places in the Old Testament where Melchizedek is connected to the new order of Jesus Christ. And, and, and when you, when, if you want to study that idea, then you go back and pull up that doctrine we did, which started this whole thing in chapter uh, 8, 9, and 10, the superior priesthood, because I laid it out there. And here's the key words, and this is what people miss. <clears throat> this is the key words about Melchizedek and Jesus Christ, that he has to be a priest forever. Remember, we talked that about it, about David when we, we talked about David. He's got to be a priest forever. Now, how can you be a priest forever? Well, you got to be raised from the dead. He dies on a cross. He's buried. He's what? Raised from the dead. He now qualifies. When he goes to heaven, he qualifies to sit on the throne for how long? Forever forever ah, you, let me tell you how important that is because you're not going to get this let me tell you how important that is when you the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ the moment you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins he took your place and, and bore the judgment for your sin. That is Adamic sin that you're under. He is buried and raised from the dead third day. The moment you believe that, you are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. You understand that? Seated with Christ is how long? Do you not understand the security of your salvation there? Our feet are still on earth. 
Our heart is with God in heaven. Our heart is with Christ. And so is God's promise to us with our feet on earth. We are seated with Christ. Listen, I'm going I'm to show you that in a moment. That's Ephesians 2, 5, and 6. We're seated with him in the heavenly places. Right now, Horton, we're seated with him. Not probation. No. Salvation. There you go, Bubba. That probation stuff. Right. Got that taken care of. That's a message for everybody in jail. And so one of the great one of the great passages on the priest forever is Psalms 110.4. They're all quoting it. When they talk about Melchizedek and a priest who can sit on the throne forever uh, uh, or uh, a priest that can be forever, a priest forever, they're quoting Psalms 110.4, which is a messianic passage to Christ. The Levit Leviticus priesthood was to point mankind to Christ for the forgiveness of sins. They couldn't do it themselves. It pointed to Christ who would come one day and complete the deal. Hebrews, the ninth chapter, 26 through 28, the 10th chapter, 1 through 4 and 10 through 14, gives you that kind of information if you have the desire to study it. And you should because there, there is where it's laid out. In the 10th chapter, verse 18, Listen, now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. Oh, what must I do? I must, you know, we get into all this goofiness with sin. What must I do to recover and do all that? Listen, there is no longer any offering. And listen, the offer, I love it because you can't offer anything to God that would be equal to what Christ offered him on the cross. Well, I promise you, I'll, you know, I'll go to church every Sunday for the next 20 years, and I'll, I'll do this, and I'll do that. And it's, it's just f foolishness. Listen to what it says. It says, no longer any offering for sin. Sin has been taken care of. The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, sin is a done deal. Personal sin isn't about judgment. It's about relationship. God is your dad. He's your heavenly father that cares more about you and your life than you do yourself. And personal sin has to deal with your relationship with God. It's called fellowship in 1 John 5, 7, and 9. I know you know that. I know you know that. But listen, the, the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, the Levitical priesthood pointed you to Christ. Galatians 3.24 pointed you to Christ. I don't think that's on your paper. And of course, I remember their sins no more. Now here's the second point. Jesus Christ acquired everything in the package of grace salvation, we talk about the 50 things that is given to every new covenant believer at the moment of believing the gospel. Every bit of those 50 things, and, and there's more. I, I quit at 50. There's a lot more than that. I gave you 50 because they overwhelm you. I, you. You pass that 50 things, and nobody, I mean... <laughs> I did that just to overwhelm you with the concept of grace. It's, it's by grace, not by works. That's the only reason I did that. Uh, my pastor did it to me with about 43. And I went, 43? But listen, I looked at all of them. I read them all. And I went, I wonder if there's any more. And off the race I went. And I, I blew right, I blew so far past 50, it's unbelievable. And I said, 50 over, 43 just about drowned me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop it to 50 because it just seemed like the right. So much bigger than you and I are grabbed. I know it's bigger than me. I study it all the time. I know it's much bigger than me. Just having the 50 things is overwhelming to me. Listen, key word. 
for me is, you know, in the South, you can share the gospel with people. Most of them, they understand it until you get to mechanics. When you get to mechanics, everybody, everybody divides and goes a separate way. Good. But there's only two ways. It's either works or grace. There, there's, no, there's no other way. It's either works or grace. And there, and there you go. So listen, you might find somebody that says, well, I believe Jesus died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead. And you think they're saved? You got to ask them one more question, right? It, 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 on what basis do you, do you accept that? You do it by faith or by works? Because there's only one way, and that's by faith through grace and not of yourself as a gift of God, not of works. At least any man should boast. Listen, if this stuff, you got to believe. Romans 1.16 is my, one of my great verses. The gospel is the power of God into salvation to, every, to everyone who believes. It's not optional. It's not optional. It's not optional. I think I just said that. It's not optional. We refer to what is acquired in the package of grace salvation as 50 things that every church age believer receives and can never lose in time and eternity. You know why? And listen, if you can't get any other verse, get Ephesians 2, 5, and in six that says the moment you believe the moment you're saved you're seated with christ in the heavenly places if you can't get anything else there's a good one <clears throat> ephesians well let's just look at it my goodness hey somebody said to me the other day well you know we could probably well, Ron, you, you don't have anything to do tomorrow anyhow, do you? Like, I mean, yeah, I only, I only work three days a week, so you probably don't. This is, Thursday's my off day. <laughs> well, who knows, but me, don't matter. Listen, what, listen, verse five. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, you know what that's from? Adam's original sin. He made us alive together with Christ. Quote, by grace you've been saved. Oh, boy. Made us alive, you know, in salvation. You've been made alive and raised us up with him because we're saved and raised now, raised us up now with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. <laughs> That's so good. That is so good. Here's another one if you need, if you don't like seated, here's one that says sealed. In case seating bothers you. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. What is that day? Well, it's when you get your resurrection body. Yeehaw. That's going to take, yeah, hee-haw or whatever that was. Hee-haw. Yeah. Here's point three. When we did the pamphlet of 50 things, we divided them into four sections of study. Divided because it was too much to lay 50 on a sheet of paper. So we broke them down into four divisions of study. 13 judicial charges of Adamic sin are removed at the point of salvation. Just to give you an idea of the awesomeness of your salvation, nine factors of communion with a holy God are established, which are important to the Eucharist. We, we talk about them uh, when we do the Eucharist. Nine works, uh, eight works, that should be eight works, eight works of the Holy Spirit, eight works. Eight works of the Holy Spirit like indwelling, for example, or sealed, eight works of the Holy Spirit. You know how you got these? So far, you know how you got all this? Grace, gifts. And then we have the 20 status privileges of the royal family of God, 
20 status privileges. We broke them down to try to help people understand what a wonderful salvation they have and to show them a new identity. You know, a good example of what's going on right now with our judge. I mean, I'd hate to, 35, I, a sophomore or junior in high school, jeez, hold me accountable today and all the stuff I did from high school up to my grown adult life is up for grabs without any evidence. We live in a sick society. Give no credit at all. But she doesn't even want to come forward. Well, we'll see. Listen, if it happened, that's okay. You understand? I, I'm, not, I'm not belittling that idea on that at all. I'm just saying when somebody can reach in a bag and pull out something that goes back to a sophomore year in high school or so and hold you accountable no matter how you have lived your life since then, that's pretty sick society that gives you no credit for uh, any achievement in your life from high school. That's, why, why, why didn't she go to her parents? Why didn't she well, go I know. To school? Well, well I don't know. If he's there, that doesn't make him finish it. I know. I'm not there. I'm not, I'm not on a, no political junk here tonight. I'm just talking about what Christ can do for your life is pretty miraculous. Everybody has a terrible background in Adam's sin. It doesn't matter about your behavior. You're locked in. Romans 5.12 says we're all sinners in, in, before Christ. We're all sinners before Christ. Christ is what brings us the real change of life. It is the true change of life. Listen, I don't know where his spiritual status is. I don't know. Apparently, he's a good moral man today. Uh, hopefully, you become that as you grow up. But listen, we all have baggage in Adam. I don't care who you are. You could, you could have been the mo most moralist person you ever knew growing up. He's still a sinner, still a sinner in need of salvation. It's, 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 it's part of who you are in Adam. Now, the answer is, is who, who are you in Christ? That's the answer. At least in God's view of life, that's what's important. That's what's important. The 20 status privileges is based on positional sanctification. So you'll see these. You'll see these three things on your piece of paper, right? Yes. You see those three things. We're about, to, we're about to get to them in a moment. It's based on positional sanctification. Positional sanctification is one of the great doctrines of the new covenant. I can't begin to tell you how important that doctrine is. When you get it under your belt and begin to explain it to other people, we call it positional truth. This is an enormous doctrine. Here it is in 2 Thessalonians 2.13, one of many passages. But we should always give thanks to God for you. That's converts. Brethren beloved by the Lord, that's who they are in Christ. They're brethren beloved by the Lord, not based on their behavior, based on the fact that they believe the gospel, the work of Christ on their behalf. Because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. That's a powerful idea. And that, notice sanctification by the Holy Spirit. That's the key. Sanctification by the Holy Spirit. That's, that's positional sanctification. Here is Ephesians 2, 5, and 8, which we just read. This time I emphasized certain words. I'm going to read it again. Watch these words. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, we were made alive together with Christ. May, now, listen, you can't be made alive apart from him. That's why it says with Christ. We're made 
alive together with whom? Because our Christ didn't just die for us. He was raised from the dead for us. Okay. Then he says, by grace, you've been saved. And he raised us up with, with him. See, our resurrection is based on his. His, his up from the grave, he arose. We benefit in. We have that life. We have spiritual life because he brought it to us. We have the forgiveness of sins. We have also life, spiritual life. Not only that, but we have the absolute assurance of the resurrection. We've been already raised with him. We have been raised where? Up or down? Well, that's, that's new. That's new. And seated with him, and seated us what? With him. Do you understand that? That with him is positional truth. That's, that's positional truth. That's positional sanctification. It's absolutely what it is. Seated us with him in the heavenly places. In, in Christ Jesus. That's positional. With him. In him. Why? So, Jesus Christ has got to die on a cross, be buried and raised from the dead in order to have an ascension and session. He's got to be seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. Right? He's got to be raised from the dead and go back. Right? When he, when he listen, when he's seated there, we get three things, right? With, with him. What are three things? No, according to, your, according to Ephesians 2, 5, and 6. Made alive. Made alive. That's number one. We're, we're made alive. Okay, now we're doing made alive. The Bible tells you what, not you. Made alive. What's the second? There's one. What's two? Ra raised up. Raised up. And three. Seated. Watch, watch this. We are with him because he goes back. And when he goes back, we're in him. This is what we get. We're with him. When he goes back, we're with him. Because, why? Because of this. And it remains this way because we're in him. We got it because he went back, and this is what we get because he's seated. This is what we get. And this remains how long? If he's seated in a resurrection body, it is forever. In him, how long? Forever. Is that not security? I mean, people go, where do you get the security idea? All over the Bible. That's where I get it. All over the Bible. All over the Bible. Of course, if you don't read the Bible, then, you know, your opinions matter to you. And so they're relative. But when you study the Bible, you get absolutes. And people who are in relativity, they hate that. How can you be so sure? Because hmm? I study the Bible. I don't care about the newspaper for truth. I study it just to see what's going on. I don't accept any truth out of it. Unless it jives up with the word of God. Well, that's narrow-minded. Okay. It's all right, May. It's going to take that narrow road is going to take me to heaven. As long as I'm not a bigot with it, my narrow mind is not a bigot. All right. At least I try not to be. And so, see how important is ascension and session is in that deal? That's that. Now, 
Come back to the same thing. Have you got an, another cross on there? All right, yeah. We'll put it back up there. Christ dies for your sins. He's buried. He's raised from the dead the third day. And because of his ascension and session, he, he mentions three things we got. It's pretty good, right? Secured forever with him, in him. That's the picture right there. We believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, Romans 1.16, the gospel of the power of God. Here is in Christ. In Christ, what gets me from salvation into Christ is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Galatians 3, 27. Right? Absolutely. Right, absolutely. And this right here, the moment you believe you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you are placed into union with Christ, which is how long? Forever. Because of the whiz. With Christ, with Christ, with Christ. Now you're in Christ, secured. This is what we call right here, this is what we call positional sanctification, which we just read out of one of many passages. We call that positional sanctification. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, we, we talked from this from 2 Thessalonians 3.13, but Galatians 3.27 3, 3, 3, tells you the same thing. Baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. When does that occur? Galatians 3.2 at the moment. The, it's, the whole transfer is by faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The whole transfer. Do you Listen, this is so simple in it. I mean, this is, listen, I'm, all I'm teaching is 101. This is milk. Now, I teach it a little, a little heavier, but it's still milk. Do you know how many people don't understand this? And this is milk. We have a great opportunity to sit down with people and really share. They are so confused. They are so hungry for the truth of the word of God. We have a great opportunity. You have it every day, every week. But we have a great opportunity to sit down with people and talk to them about things they've never heard. And that's a shame because it, I haven't talked about anything that's not in the Bible. A and I mean clear in the Bible, too. This, this is pretty clear stuff. This is pretty clear stuff. I, and I, I can't explain why it's not being done other than, other than, you know, we have an arch enemy. Now, your third circle is going to deal with, because you're in Christ, we're with him and now we're in him, dealing with the with him in him. Let me And we talked about three things. This is where the 20 status privileges come from, the 20 status privileges. That little pamphlet, the 50 things, will lay them all out for you. The, why that's important is we're talking about one of the 20. One of the 20 is called the royal. Is that on your paper? Yeah, yeah the royal, a royal priest. You are a royal priest. You don't go to school to get it. You don't have to wear a shirt backwards. You are a priest because you live in the new covenant and because you got it with Christ because you're in him. You are a priest. We are a kingdom and priest. We are part of the kingdom of God. We are of the house of God. We are of the kingdom of God. We are the priest of God. Every church age belongs. He's eternal life, you're eternal life. He's a priest, you're a priest. The list goes on. And there's more than 20. I would be happy if you knew them. That's who you are. And they're important on earth because everybody's that in heaven. And everybody knows that in heaven. Very few people 
understand that on earth. And that's a shame because it's very clearly taught in the Bible. One of the 20 status privileges of the royal priesthood. In 1 Peter, look that up. In 1 Peter, And 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9, listen, 1 Peter, 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9, watch what he says about your priesthood. Verse 5, and also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house, say that's that house, that house of God a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We're a holy priesthood. Not because of the way we live, but because of the status we have by grace. We're called a holy priest positionally. We're a holy one. We're, a, listen, to show you how important this is. It's a holy God. It's a holy Christ. It's a holy spirit. It's a holy Bible. And we're holy priest of it. And the list goes on. But I'm just telling you. That's who you're connected with. You're connected with a holy God, a holy son, a holy spirit, a holy Bible because we're holy priests. I mean, we're, we're the name of the game. Look at verse 9. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. We just talked about this uh, a couple weeks ago. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession, that you may proclaim, that you may proclaim the excellence of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's who we are. We're, we're royal priests. And we talked about that the other day. If you want to know more about that, there's a who's that. Watch this one. Let's go to Revelation 1. This is really interesting what John says. John the writer here. The writer of St. John and 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. This is what he says. The first chapter. Five and six. As he, this is his introduction to his messages to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Do you have a study Bible? Well, above verse four, they should have something like a message to the seven churches or something. Agreed? Does it have something? Yeah. Maybe, maybe, it, maybe, it, maybe they put it up above one or something. The salutation. It starts with it at verse one. Yeah, and then it says a whore. It says to the seven churches. Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, it it really should go above verse four, somewhere in there. But anyhow, because the first is the salutation, then we go to the message. Uh, John to the seven churches. See in verse four, mm -hmm. uh, and he introduced the salutation, grace to you. We'll drop down to verse five. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, look, look how John identifies him. The faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. Now look at verse 6. And he has made us to be a kingdom, comma, priest. Made us a kingdom and priest. To his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And he puts that in what appears to be a salutation when he closes with amen. He's going to do that. His, Paul, uh, John is going to do that. Let me show you. That's not uncommon for him. I don't know. I can't get to places anymore. 
Look at the last verse of, of Hebrews, uh, the last verse of uh, Revelation, last verse. Look, he opens this book with grace like all the guys do. I mean, I mean, how important was grace to the church? I mean, they, they open with it and close with it. Here's this how you grace be to you. That, look how he closes it. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. See, you have a salutation, you, ha you have a benediction, and, and they, you have the amen. And so let it be. Well, my, my point uh, on this is that we're a kingdom, positionally, we're a kingdom and priest. You are a priest whether you want to be or not. You ought to want to be. Okay? I'm trying to push the button called want to be. Want to be. And so this is important. Uh, he goes on. He talks more about this in the fifth chapter, verses 9 and 10. And he talks about it again in Re really interesting in Revelation 20. So I'm close to that. So l let me just turn back to that a moment. I had, what verse was that? Six. Verse 6. All right, 26. 20 verse 6. Listen what he says. Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. You know, that's the order of the resurrection business of 1 Corinthians 15, 20, 23. Over these, the second death has no power. That's the people who are going to be put in the lake of fire. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him. How long? You guess what that is? Well, no, <laughs> no, it's forever. Wouldn't be a thousand years. It's for a thousand years. Right? That's the millennium, right? That's the thousand year millennium. Guess what you guess what you and I are going to be, whether you want to be or not, you will be. You you I, I want you to be now, but you will be then, button. Wanna be, you will be. Two buttons. We'll be there. We'll be there. And we'll be there as what? Priest. We'll be there as rulers and priests and all kinds of things, right? So listen. You know, uh, this is football season, so this is practice time, isn't it? <laughs> right? Practice makes perfect, I guess. Not, not in Christianity, but, but anyhow. Our royal priesthood is based on the priesthood of Jesus Christ. His priesthood was, bu was built off from the order of Melchizedek. And so I, I close tonight with this idea. Hebrews 2 through 10, one of the great studies in your life one of your great studies in your life, and I wrote down a little bit to tease you, talks about the priesthood. Chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. There should be chapter 8. I didn't put one in there. There's chapter 8, 1 through 6. I know that's got to be chapter yeah, there's one, no, he talks about chapter 9, chapter 10. Here's my point. He talks about it in every chapter starting with 2 through 10. Now he's winding it down. But he's been talking about the priesthood since chapter 2. He talked about it in chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Do you think, I mean, you're always looking for a subject that is dominant. Boy, there's one talking about the new order of priesthood under the new covenant. Great study. Did you write that? I, did, I missed eight. Did you write eight, one through six? That's at least that. Okay. Hey, Jane, remind me. Hey, John, correct that on your paper, big guy. John. Okay, bud. All right, let's close in prayer. Father, we're thankful tonight that we've become aware that every believer in the new covenant, every new covenant believer is a priest, is a kingdom and priest. And we'll come back next week and we'll talk about what that means. I mean, what does it mean to be a priest? What do we do? What do we do? Tonight, we just want to be sure that everybody knows we are one. 
It's a gift of the new covenant through salvation in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are a priest. And we'll talk about next time what it means to be a priest. What are some of the things that's required of a priest? And so for tonight, Father, we thank you that you've brought us to an awareness that we are a priest, not for some time, not for a short time, but we are a priest forever. Forever. Even unto the millennium. For a thousand years. For whatever years we have left, let's be good priests. Let's be good priests. Let's exercise who we are to the world. We're priests. And we need to be taught, Father, what it means. So we thank you tonight for these that come our way by the automobile and by the internet. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.